Okay, well, thank you very much for the kind invitation to come back to Greece. One of these days, I hope to do it in person, but for now, we're going to be doing this virtually. And I wanted to describe the virtual human and digital twins for healthcare and use a particular emphasis on HPC and AI and how each of these methodologies are involved in the process of creating a digital twin. So this is not gonna let me do it. Excellent, there we go. Um, a virtual representation of a real world system is probably the best definition of a digital twin. And you can have them at many kinds of scales. So for example, in my research group, we build digital twins of proteins. My colleagues in Barcelona and in Oxford are building digital twins of the heart. Here at UCL, we're building digital twins of the circulatory system. And a human, a virtual human, is basically a digital twin of digital twins with all these digital twin components integrated in together. And the really important part of a virtual human or a digital twin for healthcare is that it has to be used to be able to make predictions for actionable outcomes. And because this is healthcare, an actionable outcome is something that relates to health and well being. So it could be something like a personalized clinical treatment that your physician makes for you or a customized therapy. And it's important that it be done on a clinically relevant timeline. So because it's actionable, it needs uncertainty, quantification built into it. It needs all sorts of elements built into it, but the most important thing that it needs built into it is the person. And this is why it can't be wholly AI based, because we are all different as individuals and AI takes a huge amount of data to make um, the most probable prediction of an outcome. But if you're that individual who's an outlier and very unique, maybe you're the only person in the world with a particular mutation in your protein, AI won't be able to solve your problem, but computing it specifically will solve your problem. So we look at multiple scales, integrating HPC and AI methods and multiple computing patterns from ensemble based things where you repeat many times to get the validated and actionable outcome you're looking for all the way up to coupled systems. And I'll talk about those in a moment because a virtual human really is doing a digital twin at all scales. So the approach to building a virtual human is to take data from different sources, information from different sources at all scales. So for example, if you're interested in building a digital heart, you would use uh, an MRI or a CT scan of the heart. You might use electrophysiological data like an EKG to build into your model. You integrate the mechanics and the dynamics so that you get to see what the organ or what you're using the digital twin component does at across a time scale. You can look at cell models, you can look at genomics and other omics and see how the influence of the genome affects the resulting proteins. This is starting to get very close into what Rossum was describing. And in fact, we use Gromax substantially for this. So we're really sister centers of excellence working together in this area. So to give you a first example of building a virtual human, if you are interested in solving a particular problem, COVID is a really good example. People were looking for COVID inhibitors and you understand what the target protein or proteins are. You can take a look with a binding affinity calculator or calculations of binding for energies. You can look at the mutations that people have and take all of this information together to work out what a particular variant binds best. For an individual that might be treatment A, for another individual it might be treatment B, you might have a mix of treatments, but you're basically combining the genome information with the protein binding efficacy information to work out how to treat an individual. For this, we actually use both physics-based models and machine learning models. We have developed a drug discovery workflow, which is open source and has the entire drug discovery pipeline. It uses docking and machine learning predictions to refine the docking scores and then goes through binding affinity calculations to come up with binding free energy estimates and choose the best drug out of a number of different possibilities that you start with. Another example of building a virtual human and a digital twin component involves a coupled system. So HemLB is a code that 
works out blood flow through the entire human vasculature. You can see that on the right. Let me see if I can get a pointer without having a problem. Use the pointer. Where's the pointer gone? There's the pointer. Sorry, we'll get there eventually. There we go. So this is the entire human vasculature here that is being simulated blood flow through this. And this is ALIA, which is the Barcelona Supercomputing Code, Center's code for the mechanical and the electrical coupling in the heart. And you can actually couple these two codes together. So now you have a digital twin heart driving digital blood through a digital vasculature. And so you can see with this example how you can build things up, ultimately getting towards a virtual human. Now, a really important part of this is to work out how to use these technologies by people who are in the biomedical community. And this is something that's primarily experimental or clinical. There's been very little computational work done in this area for a variety of reasons. But let's take a look at this. So when Comp Biomed started as a center of excellence in 2016, we had very minimal access to supercompute. Now I've just shown the data for Archer, which was one of the UK supercomputers. It's been deprecated now and replaced with Archer 2. But in 2016, only 0.2% of the use of Archer was for medical work and 9.8 was for biological work. And you can see that there's a disproportionate usage by people in the mathematical and physical sciences and the engineering sciences. And you can also see from the relative number of degrees awarded in these different areas that it's not due to fewer people going into the field, it's used to fewer people in the field using these resources. So this was the starting point. And we thought we would need to do something about this. So we started to build a community of practice and we began with medical students and bioscience students as undergraduates. This is a fantastic sustainability program because there's no better way to keep something going for decades than to put it as a formal part of the university curriculum. And we created a very simple genomics workflow where we collected experimental data and analyzed it computationally. And you can see that over the seven years of doing this and delivering it to uh, medical students, we've managed to take our course and port it from one university to another university, which is quite difficult to do. And this year we're bringing a course we've made at the other university back to the one university. And this is a proof and concept for being able to take it everywhere. So you should expect in the next year or two to be seeing these courses becoming available and the medics on HPC program coming to a medical school near you and to also biosciences near you. It's got different modalities of delivery. This was facilitated significantly by COVID in 2020. And we suddenly discovered that we could actually teach a large number of students very effectively in this way. Overall, Lena mentioned that we've taught almost 2,500 students and you can see that we're accelerating. If you look in particular at the number of bioscience students, we have learned to automate and scale. So we can teach very effectively 150 to 250 students in person, all getting them onto HPC and using these sorts of resources and enhancing the sophistication of what they use. So we've been able to crack the training problem and create a whole generation of biomedical researchers that now have an expectation and a culture of seeing high performance computing and machine learning methods in the practice that they do professionally in their science and in their medicine. So, Although the landscape was poor in 2016, this is what biomedical access to supercomputers looks like in 2023. Uh, up in the upper left, SuperMuCanG and Marinostrum 4, and I can't, Marinostrum 5 is not up here, but these are the machines that we've been using as part of the center of excellence. This is Archer, the original machine, and now it's replacement that we collected our data from. And we've used um, the facilities at SURF significantly, Cartesius, and now Snellius. And of course, we've moved on to exascale machines. So Aurora is not yet in service, but Frontier is, and we are now running calculations on Frontier to build components of the virtual human as we speak. In fact, I think I've got some running across Frontier this week, which is really exciting. 
So I just wanted to give you a personal perspective to help put this in context, because I'm actually an experimental molecular biologist interested in how cells behave. And I'm particularly interested in novel drug development targets like dimerized receptors. And you can see here an example of how we used to use high throughput calcium imaging, and we'd collect data. The biphasic curve indicates a dimerization um, event that we're seeing, where this is the monomer, and this is the novel dimer, and this is something we try to target. So when CompBiomed started, I began to get access to computers. We started looking at very simple systems, looking at these transmembrane domains and how closely they interacted with each other and the nature of the interaction. And we did this on tier two machines locally here at University College London. Now we're in 2023 and we're building 600,000 atom systems in Gromax, which is a fabulous MD engine, I have to say, Ross, and it's really brilliant. We're building these systems and we're running them on Frontier to do binding free energy calculations downstream of them. So this is a significant evolution and it is my goal and that of my colleagues that we be able to take other experimentalists on the same journey as rapidly and as efficiently. So in terms of benefits and challenges, it's absolutely fantastic to see students who have not really had much to do with computers, certainly have not seen the command line before, used resources that are significantly computational, just become incredibly fluent and go off and find new ways and new things to do with these machines. We've had medical students who have to do an intergalated bachelor's degree, start to move away from more medical subjects and start to do their bachelor's degrees in mathematics, computers, and medicine. We've had students who have been on our SSC training program, who now want to complete medicine, but do PhDs in computational neuropsychiatry. So develop a whole new part of a whole new digital twin for the virtual human. We've had students who've been given accounts on CompBiomed machines as part of their training, who a year or two or three later have come back and said, I want to do MD simulations with this, not genomics, but MD. Can I have my account back? So we've been expediting those things. Uh, we have access to a number of machines and Summit was one of the ones in the United States that we were doing scaling on. And we managed to break it when it was in block operation mode because there were too many jobs running across it. And we now understand more about scaling up to Exascale and that you need middleware pilot job managers to help navigate how things run on the machine. And I'm tremendously pleased that a bioscientist, in fact, one of my master's students was in the team that made this discovery. And from a political side, it's really important that people understand the value, the benefits of having investment in these areas and being able to use these resources for healthcare. So we are increasingly engaging with politicians, including with the UK science minister. Of course, there are challenges. It is, I showed you that we were able to start scaling our digital training, but it is a challenge to get the large number of experimental and clinical people out there familiar with these methodologies and tools and interested in using them more. So creating a culture of engagement is just starting to gain traction. Access to funding has been challenging because if people aren't using the resource, then it's not something that's familiar to the funding agencies and requests are not necessarily understood. But again, we're starting to make inroads in that. Access to resources, well, it's always difficult getting onto machines, but I think I've shown you that over the seven years that we've been doing our program, we've gotten a little bit better at that. And then of course, there's always resistance to change. However, we're creating a generation, a new generation of biomedical researchers who are absolutely dead keen to use these methodologies and resources and technologies. So we think that the resistance to change will abate as well. And this is about a quarter of Comp Biomed at our conference. We have a biannual conference and this was held at LRZ in Munich this year. Um, this is Comp Biomed and all the variety of people underneath. You can see where they come from and what their involvements are. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. You can find us on the usual social media channels or on our website, or you're very welcome to email me if you'd like. Just stick EuroCC Greece in the subject header and I'll find you very easily. And thank you very much, Lena.